Yeah, I think it should be okay. Okay. It should be okay for a while. We'll have to find an, an undergrad to hold it. <laughs> Oof. We're gonna be going back a bit. Yeah, I'm sure it works. It's the best place to actually be on top of the building. Yeah, but then, yeah, perfect. And it probably would be a good idea. It's gonna be a little tough. What's that? You gonna try to record and take pictures? Or? It's gonna, it, we're gonna live broadcast a periscope. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't flop over. That's actually not bad. If I have just like a piece of tape or something. My phone has the friction backing.
Do you, did, do you have access to this? Uh, no, JTD 5.5. JTD? Yep. 5.5.5? Five, five, five? No, it's 2.5. Yep. Okay. All right, you all have access. So um, I'll go over quickly what we did a little bit yesterday so that way some people can catch up. Um, so uh, the way that this is going to be structured is we have a lot of things, particularly right now in our, in our studio, um, R is a st statistical programming language. Um, if you're just joining us today, uh, if you go to the class presentations in here and op open up uh, the introduction to R, it's actually, R, actually I meant um, the tea time starter pack. Um, in here, it tells you all the things that you'll kind of need and specifically uh, R and R Studio. Because um, the way that we'll like to do this is that um, myself and some other people will create some scripts and we'll run through the scripts as you guys also have the scripts and you start filling in um, all the blank spaces uh, and then running those um, in your session to make sure and prove to yourself that you can actually run some R code. Um, and then hopefully as we go through all these things you start to understand how R works and then all the different applications that um, we can do with it. Uh, so. Yeah, and here there's uh, R for Windows. So if you go to www.rproject.org, that's the R project. If you're going to want to, um, I'll just do it one more time again. If you go to R, you'll want to say, oh, I want to download. So you hit CRAN. It'll ask you to pick a mirror, and we have one at the case. So if you go down to the US, and you look over here and find Case Western. We have our own CRAN mirror, and you can download it from there. And really, I think download it from any of these. Um, and then uh, pick your operating system, Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, and then uh, you'll also want to get RStudio, which is down here. Same kind of deal. Um, so RStudio is, uh, is an integrated development environment, and it's basically what we like to use R in because it looks real nice. Um, so in here, uh, the download, somewhere in here, right here, our studio for desktop. Um, and a quick thing, oh, that's not supposed to be there. Um, so we'll open a file. So that's our studio right there. Um, so up here is our global environment. It has a ton of the variables and all different things that we're doing. Um, right here has a lot of things like plots. Um, uh, plots, some the files that we're currently working on, uh, packages that we're using, help files. I'll show you some more of this as we go along. For those who were there yesterday, you guys saw a lot of this. Um, this is our console where we throw in all of our um, uh, our commands and actually is run. And then up in the top left is um, where we are able to edit things. It's our editor editing scripts, also viewing um, data frames, viewing data. Uh, viewing other things that we want to do. Um, so I'm going to pull up uh, from where we left off yesterday. So everyone that was with us yesterday, uh, we were doing uh, tea time class one, and we got about halfway through it. So we're going to finish the rest of that one today, go through what's uh, left in there. I have to go find it real quick because I'm on a different computer than I was yesterday. Um, let's see where it is. Um, and for those of you who didn't, who weren't with us yesterday, I'll end up posting um, uh, the whole tea time that I have that has all the master stuff in it, so you can run through all the functions yourselves, and it's all um, out there. For everyone else who grabbed the class one that has underscore name on it off the drive, it's not completely filled out, so you can fill it out as we go um, and kind of learn with it on the fly. So I'm going to jump down to where we were yesterday. And don't mind all the extra stuff in here. I should probably clean that out. There's a broom in R that lets you uh, clean your entire um, environment, make it all kind of nice, easy to work with. Um, so let's see. Move down. Okay, so yesterday we just finished looking at um, data frames, um, or really starting to look at data frames. 
um, and then some other things that we can do with our data frames. So um, if we make two variables, a equals one to five, um, and control enter, we'll make that happen. Um, see, this didn't clear out. I think I have too much data in my current R studio session, so it's not letting me do anything. So I'm gonna open up a new one. Uh, just way too much stuff going on. So, um, so now we want to do some different things past the data frame stuff. Um, so if we set a variable A equals 1 to 5 and B equals 20 to 24, we just created two vectors there, um, or mm -hmm. arrays, whatever you want to call them, uh, with both of integer values. Um, so we have A and B, now we can bind these two together. So if we wanted to view um, A, uh, we'd have a vertical array right there of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and then if we viewed B, we'd have the same thing with some different uh, numbers. So if we want to now push these together, which happens a lot of times when we have different data sets that we're collecting from, well, maybe your machine turned off at you know, whatever hour and then turned back on, and now you have to merge those two back together, um, we can do a thing called rbind and cbind. So cbind will combine all of the rows together, um, so it'll stack them on top of each other, so we'll do that real quick. Um, we'll save this actually as C equals uh, R. And so if we view C, it's going to stack both of those arrays on top of each other um, lengthwise. If we do it with C bind, which is column bind, um, I'll call this one E, because I see there's a D down there. Oh, actually, I just did it down there. Um, do this and view D, it combines them the other way. Um, so what it's doing is it's taking A for C bind, it's taking A and B and pushing them together as the columns. And then for um, C when we're doing row bind, it's taking both of them and combining them as rows. Um, so if you have a lot of extra data or something that isn't in a certain timestamp, you can add those on as columns or if you have new data that you want to add to your data frame, you want to uh, do the row bind. Right, any questions on that? Um, yeah, I think. Well, you have to tell it which way you want it to do it. So R bind and C bind is able to do that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you could do um, uh, F equals C, A, B. We'll see if that works. And then viewing F. So yeah, you can concatenate them together just using by the command C, which is concatenate. We're adding a couple extra things. Right, so there's some traditional things in there. Um, so uh, these also must be equal lengths. So we can't do six rows and five rows and try to put those together in columbine or in rowbine. They're not going to fit. They need to be the same dimensions, so that's something that you always have to check for um, to make sure you can do that. Um, uh, here's some other useful functions that we've found to be kind of useful for looking at things. So uh, we can ask um, if uh, we can ask which row out of D, so D is this one over here, so it has our kind of matrix. And so we can ask which row in there has the value two. And so it'll look in there, and we can ask row, and it'll say row two. Um, let me explain this just a little bit better. So if we're looking at D, and again, this is for the newcomers, this one right here is rows, and this is columns inside the square brackets. If you don't say what row you're on, it includes all of the rows. Um, and then 
The second one is columns. And so we're saying, let's look in column one, all of the rows, which one will equal the number two? So look over here, column one, all of the rows, which one equal two? And it told us down here that row of two. Or you're going a bit too fast, can you repeat that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so again, with if we're looking at D as a matrix, it has two columns. Um, and in those two columns, and using the syntax that R uses of brackets, the first uh, thing you put in here, so we can put in one, that refers to row one. And the second one refers to a column. So this would be column one. Um, but we want to know out of all of the rows, so we're not going to put a value in there. It'll look at every single row in there. All the rows in column one, which one equals two? Um, so this is useful for a lot of things because sometimes we want to know where's the minim minimum value or the maximum value in our data frames, and we can ask, actually, which.max um, is another one that'll say, oh, this is the row in your column that you're curious about that is a max. Or we could ask the entire data frame and find the exact dimensions as well. Yeah, so we could say which dot max, and really all we need to do is D. And it will tell us, if we look at max, um, 10. Um, and 10 in this is actually a little bit of a misnomer there because I may not be using that correctly because it's actually referring to if you counted all the columns down and then count, count it to the next one, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's returning ten. I wouldn't do it that way. That's why I didn't really put it in here. Um, but yeah, is that right? <laughs> uh, so if we keep on moving on, is that all right with that kind of area? So you can ask different questions. So we could ask which of the rows or which of the columns equals a certain number or something that we want to know. Um, the more specific you ask your question, the better answers you're probably going to get. Um, so there's some other nice built-in functions that R has and a lot of other effects. Uh, uh, does which, uh, let's say if you had another row that also had the value 2, would yes. it give you multiple it outputs? It will give you multiple. Uh, so if we had uh, 20 rows in there in the first column and 10 of them had the number 2, it would return 10 values all giving you those particular rows that have found that value in there. Um, uh, there's some other functions that are in R and also in a lot of other computer languages that are kind of built in or you can get with um, uh, different packages. Uh, so some of the quick and easy ones to use in R are the is the mean value of D, so it'll look at all of the values in that matrix and report to you what's the mean value within that matrix that you had. We could look at the standard deviation. What's the standard deviation among all those numbers? Um, we could find the minimum value in there, which is one, um, which makes sense, one's right there. And then we can also look at the max value inside there, which is 24, and 24 is the max value. Um, so this is just kind of some quick functions that you can run through to look at your data. Any questions on those? All right, now uh, I'll start talking about for loops and if statements, in particular with R, because every language has its different syntaxes for how you run for loops or if statements. Um, so for uh, a for loop in R, you say for parentheses, um, some variable. Now, I, most people like to choose I to start out with. I in one to something or two to something, uh, any two numbers for how many times you want to loop and what values you want i to loop through. Um, so in here, parentheses i and one to five, uh, uh, squirrely bracket, or squiggly bracket, not squirrely. Um, and then uh, you put whatever uh, input you want it to do on any type of array, data frame, matrix, you name it, whatever you want it to do, you throw it in there. And then you finish it off and let it know that the entire for loop is inside the next uh, squiggly bracket. Um, and if statements are similar uh, with the squiggly brackets starting and ending the if statement. And uh, you'll put if parentheses 
and you'll give it some conditions. So uh, we could say that when i equals 5. Um, and so the logical operators in R are something that um, for each one you kind of have to look up to see what it does. But for equivalence, it's double equal sign. So here we'd say if we loop through it five times, once it got to 5, it would go into the if statement. Um, and everything else, it wouldn't let it. What's that again? Uh, if you have a one liner, so if I have yeah, A and C, you only you don't need uh, curly braces if you have one liner. Okay, I don't know, uh, Jack. Do you know? No, it's no, no. You, you're I'm getting a yes. And then for narrative statements, it, do they exist as one liner? Yes. Yeah, yes. If, if it's a one liner, you don't need the curly braces, but it's a good idea to use yeah. them. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm actually background of me. I'm a mechanical engineering student. I actually didn't program at all until I started learning R, and I actually never read a book to do R. It was all stackoverflow.com. It was all I used, and uh, and Mohammed over there are the only two really resources that <laughs> was able to learn everything. But I don't know what ternary or I don't know I don't know any of the good technical stuff. So, but uh, but in terms of running R, I guess I know. Um, so uh, moving from that, we can do a quick example. Um, so the first thing we can use the function. Sorry, before we want, um, how do you calculate like you have mean, standard deviation stuff? How do you get quartiles? The what? Quartiles. Oh, quartiles. Mm -hmm. um, or how do I? There's a way. Find how Summer. to. Prove. Summary. So, that's it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's actually a function. So if we did summary of d, this is a nice. Uh, oh, that's nice function in R. So summary tells us all the different statistics about that particular matrix that you were looking at. So the first thing is the min. Um, it's also going to look at uh, both of the A's and the B's separately in this case. Um, I'm not sure how to make it look at all of them. But it'll give you the min values in each um, column, uh, and then I guess your quartiles and all that, and median. So it's kind of nice. Summary would look at the vector. So if you use C, if you concatenated them as a single vector, you could use summary and get Oh, them. yes. Yeah, so if we did, um, back we concatenated everything into F. So if we do summary of F, that will give us all of the um, uh, values for everything that's inside there. But we just have to set it up in a different way. In the matrix form, it will do each column. And then in one nice vector, it will do that entire thing. So F, we concatenate everything. So then we can get that summary. So yeah, summary is a really nice thing, and you can use it on a lot of different objects um, in R. After you uh, created anything in here, you can take a summary of it, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so moving on, uh, we can take the length. We'll just do a real quick example. So if we want to take the length of D, we can use the function length, and we'll say D, no row, column 1. So it's basically going to take the length in terms of rows um, of our matrix there, and we'll use that. So if we take the length there, and we just set it as length, we can run through this for loop with an if statement in there as a quick and easy example. Um, so if we say 4 uh, from i equals 1 to length, which we know is 5 from looking at for a while, uh, we'll run that. And we'll say that for all the values of i, as it iterates through, it's going to set them equal to 100. Um, but then if i equals 2, we're going to set that particular one to 200, and then we're going to close out our if statement and close out our for loop. And then we can run through all of that. So if we hit that, let me scroll back up. Okay. Um, so it just ran through the for loop, and if we print it out D, oops, uh, we can see that the first column there has now changed 1, 3, 4, and 5 all to 100. And the second one, which was when i equals 2, changed it to 200. Uh, what is for like the equivalence of break in the for loop in R? The what? Mm -hmm. The break. The break. Oh, to use break? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can use break. Um, it's basically the same type of syntax as, I think, other codes. 
Um, but yeah, if you give it a, uh, some condition and say, okay, break out of this, move on to the next thing, works pretty well. I've actually never used break. Just now I think about it. I guess my research doesn't need it. But, um, yeah. I think we could actually do yeah. Good. control flow. Yeah. So, um, so nice thing with R is that every time that you have a question, you just do question mark and break, which made sense that there's probably a function that's break, and it gives you all the different uh, descriptions of how it um, is used, the different arguments that you need to put in there, like a condition, if a condition, whatever, um, to break, um, and all those things. And then I think it probably has some examples down here. So we could uh, probably run that, but In here? For? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so the first one says we're going to start a for loop with mm -hmm. four, um, and it highlights itself as blue to kind of indicate that it's a function um, uh, that's built in. And then uh, we're going to say inside the parentheses, we're going to give it what we're going to loop through. So mm -hmm. we're going to say i, we could say k, j, some random variable. Say i, and we're going to say it's going to go from n1 to length or we could say in two to length. Uh, we can tell which one we want it to start at and which one we want it to end at. We can hard code it in as two or three, or we can put in variables like length if we ran some other matrix. Mm -hmm. um, and then the curly brackets indicate this is now the start of the for loop for everything to happen in there. So now this first one is going to go um, in the matrix D or data frame um, of the index row I, so the ith row, whatever value that is in the for loop, in column one is going to equal 100. Um, then with the if statement, it's going to check every single time to say, OK, if, highlighted blue, i is equivalent to 2 um, with the double equal sign. Uh, then cur uh, squiggly bracket or curly bracket, uh, looking in d of that i to 1, in this case, it's only going to be two. So the second row, first column, is going to equal 200. And then end that operation with the if statement uh, in the curly bracket. And then finish off uh, the for loop. Now, if I just inputted to here, it's going to ask me for, well, we know that you had a for loop happening. And you had a curly bracket, and you had another curly bracket only closed one curly bracket, you need to close the last one before the operation will start and finish pretty quick. So, all right. Good on for loops and if statements? And the i n means it's an integer? Um, I wonder if it does. I've always just thought of it as like n one to something, um, but it is, I think, always as an integer value to run through the i's because it's always indexing through rows and columns is really the only way I think you want to use your for loops. Um, so it will always be integers. You can actually use uh, for loops to loop through anything that's a collection. So if you had a collection of uh, like names, you could do for, and then you might want to call the variable you're looping through every single one name, and then you just have a collection of a bunch of strings. So the for loop can loop over anything that's a, a collection items. So it could be a collection of numbers, it could be a collection of strings or other objects that you might have. Okay. We'll make an example of that for the next class. Um, I'll write a note. Um. <coughs> All right. Um, any other questions on the for loops and if statements? All right, moving to the next thing. So working directories. Um, working directories are very important for any coding that you could possibly be doing um, because you need to look at the right files and you tell your computer where to look and where to find things. Um, so if you want to find where you are, you type in right now get wd um, parentheses. It will tell you where you are. So right now I'm in C users and configuring documents. Um, and so if I wanted to load any folders or whatever, um, which actually you can just view in the files 
Or I believe you can do, will Dur get me there? Yeah, so this will have all these different um, funny things in here that I have. Uh, so that has all the different files and everything that I could possibly access that are at this moment because that is the current directory that I'm sitting in. Um, this one right now is actually not updated um, because it's not actually my, this is something else, the files. But most of the times whenever you set the directory, because um, I haven't set it yet, I was just looking at the directory, your files will change over to whatever directory you are so you can easily kind of look and see what's kind of sitting in there and then go from there. Um, so we can set the directory, um, but we have to point R to where that directory is. And the way that you're able to do that is with set WD. Um, will allow you to set a working directory, but I didn't put any path in there, so it won't take us there. A nice um, shortcut and like pro tip is if you do control shift H. Control shift H brings up, oh, go choose a working directory if you don't want to type in the whole path. Um, and I could say, okay, well, I'm going to go to downloads because I know I'm going to download something in a bit. And I'm going to select that folder as my um, current directory and read things through. Um, uh, there's also two ways that if you want to do the path way, um, there's a couple different things. If you wanted to, if I wanted to set my working directory to the higher folder up, I would do parentheses dot dot, and that would take me one up. So if I looked at my working directory again, I'm now out of downloads into the higher folder of even bigger. Now I can go back to it, um, and I have to use the dot symbol. The dot symbol will keep me where I'm at, and then it will allow me to continue. So now if I looked at it, I'm back in downloads. Um, so that's kind of the computer science way to do it a little bit more. Um, so now that we're in some directory, know what directory you are, and we would, we're going to write a file into that directory and then reload it again. So we had just been working on D for a while, so now we're going to write to a CSV. So a CSV is a comma separated um, uh, file, uh, so it's delimited by com um, just by commas. It has um, your characters or strings or numbers in there, then a comma, and then the next thing, comma, the next thing, comma. Um, they're typically one of the best ways to deal with data. Uh, they're really easy to use. You can open them up in Excel files, but as data, you, being data scientists, you really just want to work with all your data in, uh, in R or a programming language because it's just so much, uh, you can manipulate things so much easier. Um, so if we uh, went through and said, okay, we have our variable D, we wrote the function write.csv, and we know D is the variable we want, and we'll give it a name. We have to write .csv after it, or else it won't be a CSV file. So we write .csv, we run that, and um, if we looked at, see I'm in downloads right now. If I reloaded my files in here, because I reset the directory, there's .dcsv. So .dcsv is just sitting out there now on my local computer, as a new file, I can go in here and find it, um, and I should be able to open it up as. Oops, got too many things on here. Oh, I'm at the bottom. That's why. So it it looks at it, your Windows computer. If you have a Windows computer, I have a Windows computer. It looks at it and goes, "Oh, a CSV. That's an Excel spreadsheet. We're going to open it up." Um, so we could open that up, and it really shouldn't take very long because it's extremely small. And there we go. We have uh, the rows and the columns and our file, and then also all the little pieces that we put in there. So we just wrote it to a CSV. Um, now we can read it back in. So um, we can say E equals read.csv. So write.csv writes it, read.csv will read it. So now we can read that back in, E equals read CSV, and it just read it. If you're having problems reading it, it might be because you're in the wrong working directory, but if you just wrote it and then read it, you should be in the same working directory. Um, so now we'll look at E again. So there it is, that is D. There is one little exception to 
the way this looks and the way D looks, that there's one extra column in here. And these are actually the row names. Um, as you save CSVs, it tends to like to save the row names, and then when you read it back in, you'll have an extra column. Um, but there's a way to get around that. Um, where are we here? If we actually write that, write.csv d, d.csv, and then throw in the command row.names equals false, it will save again, but this time, uh oh, oh, I have it open. You can't save something to something that's already open. So that's, that's also a key thing. So now that that's closed, um, we can write it again. And then if we read it back in and look at it again, there's no row names. Um, because R independently puts the row names on for you, so you don't need to really save your row names. Um, you can bring it back up, it looks just how it used to be. So now we've written a CSV and now we've read it back in. Right. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, there's a couple other ways that you can read in data. Um, read.table is one of them. Um, I've never really used read.table, uh, but what I have used is read.delim. So if you had a text file that your machine or whatever was um, outputting to you um, and it was delimited by some way, it could be space delimited or tab delimited. Um, I tend to see mostly tab delimited. And um, so you can do read.delim. And if we looked at question mark read.delim, which is actually two read.delim functions. It gives you all the different um, uh, the usages for it. And then uh, like read.csv, read.delim, read.delim2, uh, all the arguments, file, all the different separation things that you would need in there. Um, in the case that this is a delimited file, tab delimited file, um, I add in here uh, sep, so sep equals separation. So it looks for what is the separation in your file that's going to mark off the next column in there. Um, so in this case, we're going to say, I don't actually have a blah.txt, I just wrote this in there, so I can't read in a blah.txt. But um, uh, we would look for a delimited file that with having sep equals um, dat or slash, backslash, I don't know which slash it is, but slash T will say, hey, we're looking for a tab delimited. Make sure that when you read it in, you make the columns between all the tab delimiteds. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so now another cool, really cool thing about R is that R is open sourced. So a ton of people work on R, a ton of people write functions and then they take all those functions and they bundle them up into a package and then they put it up on CRAN where you were able to get R in our studio originally and you can on the fly, as long as you're connected to internet, install some package that someone all the way across the world made for a specific problem that only you and 10 other people have and now you have a nice package with all the functions to solve all your problems. So that's a really nice thing about R compared to something like uh, MATLAB, where in MATLAB you would have to Google it, find it, copy paste it, put it in your thing, fix all the paths, save it, and then run it. Um, with R, you can just simply install and it is there. Um, so here's a really quick example for that. So one thing that we like to use a lot is ggplot2. ggplot2 is a really cool plotting package. We'll talk about it a little bit more um, at some point. Um, uh, it's really nice. So we could write install.packages, run that, and I think I already have it installed on here so it might not do too much, but you can see the stop sign things popping up. And so what it's doing is it's now looking on the internet, it's trying to find it, and once it finds it, it'll start downloading it. Uh, usually it doesn't take nearly this long, it's usually almost instantaneous, like five seconds or so. Um, so I don't know why this is being a trick. Oh, I can't find the server. That's like the first time this ever happened. <laughs> I guess the internet's bad right here. Well. But is it to automatically find it? Yes, it automatically finds it. It's 
really nice. It usually works. Like, Mine did. Did, you, did, you block did it find it? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, now it found it. Um, so it's installing the package to the uh, Windows library for R. Um, it's trying some other um, URLs. It now has the package. It's downloaded. It's all good to go. Um, and another thing is that a lot of these packages have dependencies on other packages. So let's say you had some MATLAB code again, and you looked for it, and you found this MATLAB code, and you used it, and then you realize, oh, five of these functions are actually some other thing that I gotta go find somewhere else, and all that stuff. This will automatically do that for you. So um, there's various different functions that it had, or packages that it had to find, installed all of them simultaneously, and now you're good to go with ggplot. There's one last thing that we have to do. We have to library in all the functions. Um, so if we hit library, it will give us a quick warning message that uh, the last version was 3.2.5, and I think this one's 3. Point something else. Um, uh, this one right here is 3.2.1, and that's because I haven't updated my R in a while. So it, that's my fault, not its fault. Um, and then another cool thing, we can do, go question mark, question mark, ggplot2. And uh, the difference between one question mark and two question marks is two question marks will ask for all of the documentation that surrounds an entire package. So in here, we have all of the help pages that can be um, grabbed for ggplot. Um, and we can look at all those things. Uh, there's a thing called vignettes. Vignettes are long form documentation. Uh, it comes with an HTML, so you can open up a HTML. This is by Hadley Wickham. He's like the, the R wizard. Um, and it kind of goes through every single function in there with examples, how to do it, how to run it. You can throw this code directly into your console and have it run. Um, it's, just, like, it's just too simple and too, uh, too easy to find your answers, really, is what R does for you, which is um, really nice. Um, so. Yeah, there's ggplot in action, it does some pretty cool things. So um, that finishes this tea time class one that took two tea time classes, um, but really we almost named them like A, B, C so they can just kind of keep on going. Um, we do have a little bit more, I think we have like five minutes, so Jack was gonna show some plotting, so how now you use R to make plots, um, and we'll pull that up right now and see how far we get. I would say plotting is the other real good thing about R in that a lot of it is trying to be very visual um, and show things in an interesting way. So there's a lot of cool plotting options. Uh, yeah, as Ethan said, the, I, I think one of the greatest advantages of R is its visualization. Uh, there's great libraries and language like Python to do the analysis, but none of them really have uh, the plotting or visualization capabilities of R. Um, so what I'm gonna go through are just some very simple uh, plotting functions. Um, once again, this code is in the drive, um, so you can go ahead and follow along uh, if you would like. Um, I think it's just named the exact same thing, but with uh, tea time session two. Um, so some of this code up here is just uh, installing a package. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. Make sure I have this data sets package, which basically just has some sample data frames that I can use to show you some of the plotting uh, capability. Um, so one of the data sets that's available in this package is called MT cars. I'll go ahead and view that so you can see what it looks like. It has all these different uh, car uh, types with certain statistics like miles per gallon, how many cylinders does it have, the displacement, horsepower, uh, weight, uh, et cetera. So that's the uh, data set that we're dealing with. And I'm gonna go ahead and probably just for today go through uh, creating a simple line graph so we have this data frame uh, available in our global environment, and it has all these different columns. <coughs> now the normal way to access a certain column of our data frame is to type the name of the data frame, and then a dollar sign, 
And then, as we can see, it auto-completes for us. And then we put the name of the column. So if I wanted to access miles per gallon, I just put MPG, which is the column name. And now I'm accessing that row. And so that's a vector. It's actually giving me back a vector containing all the miles per gallons for all the cars. But if I didn't want to prefix every single column with MT cars, there's this nice little feature where you can just say attach MT cars. And what that does is it loads every single column into your uh, global environment so that you don't have to uh, preface it with the data frame name. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, use the basic plot function that R has. It takes in an X and a Y and plots it for us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, oh, I did. did yeah. So I need to run the attach. I can plot both of them. And you can see in that bottom right area, that's where plots are displayed on the plot tab. Uh, and we have weight here and miles per gallon. Um, and in this case, it defaults to a uh, two dots, so like a dot plot. One really cool thing are these, once again, built-in uh, functions that are available. So LM stands for linear model. And you can just provide two variables that you want to uh, produce your linear model. So here I'm saying model equals linear model. The only weird syntactic thing is to separate your two variables. You use uh, the squiggly. Uh, up in the left hand corner of your keyboard. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. Now in model, I have stored a linear. Yes? What's the difference between using a comma and using the squiggly length? Oh, so this, Why, yeah. it's specific to the linear model function. The comma is for accessing a certain row or a certain column or a certain element in your matrix. This is saying, I want to compare the column. I want you to use the column miles per gallon and the column weight when we create to create your linear our linear model. Uh, to be a little bit more precise, for plot, plot is a function, and it's expecting x, the x-axis, and then the y-axis. Yeah. And model, the tilde, means formula. So it's a linear model that's going to do y as a function of x. Oh, that's interesting. So, yes, yeah, so. Uh, like he said, Y is a function. Um, so now, kind of an obscure function name, AB line, adds our model to our plot in the bottom right. So if I go ahead and run that, as you can see, the linear model we created is now added uh, to our plot. Uh, one, yeah. Th throw a summary of the model. Oh, yes. Well. This is another cool thing that summary does is if you made, made a model, so this was a, a, a linear regression, least squares fitted, um, and so it took those two variables, pushed them together, um, and then created this model, and those are all the things that are in there. It has your coefficients, um, your estimated standard deviation, error, t value, uh, p value, um, whether or not those things were significant, and also gives you things like your um, R squared value, your multi uh, and your adjusted R squared value as well, and F statistics. Um, so it gives you a lot of cool, interesting things. How did you get that R squared? Uh, it's summary. called summary. The same thing we called before. So um, summary of the model. The model. Yeah. Okay. So as uh, we, I was mentioning yesterday, R, R has a lot of objects, so we can consider everything as an object. Summary of an object gives us everything that it knows about that current object sitting in there. So before we had a data frame and we said summary and said here are all the things about this object and now we made a model and said summary here are all the things about this new object. And then the last thing you can do is just call the title function that adds a title to our current plot so now we can see regression of uh, miles per gallon on weight. Um, so that's a, an easy way to have a title to your plot. So I'm going to end it there. Any questions on plotting? I was going to throw one more quick thing up there. Just so if you guys are curious of what we're going to hit in the next coming sessions and weeks, I'm going to pull it up really quick.
just so you know, so you're not just coming in blind. Um, it might take me a quick second to find it. Um, it should be here. And um, tomorrow we'll be showing a ton more on the plotting. So that was just the surface of it. Jack's going to keep on going with it. And then we'll even show you some GG plot stuff um, that just makes things look really cool. That is, this is not the right one. Oh, where did it go? Here it is. So um, uh, we're gonna have. So we've been doing basic R right now, um, and so we've gone through a lot of kind of the basic R stuff that we'll just basically be repeating over and over again as we're going through um, the different topics. Uh, I guess this was a bad choice to load this and present it, so it was actually bigger. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big mess. <laughs> okay, there it is. So right now we are basically uh, finish this. Um, and now we're going into basic graphics, which is what we were just starting, ggplot, and also things called pairwise plots, which basically looks at correlations of a lot of different data sets you have and makes a quick vis visualization. Um, and then we're going to go into something like cl uh, clustering, so clustering your data sets, looking into that, uh, how, you give, how you handle NAs, binding things, deleting rows, state formats, all that stuff. Um, then we're going to run through a lot of linear regression modeling, um, and really even some non- uh, linear regressions as well, but to a, but a much more um, interesting and involved instead of just one little da data set. We'll throw a ton of variables in there. Um, assessing fits and things like that, also some things called uh, peak fitting, uh, looking at some things that we do, and then also the last piece is uh, making your own package. So if you made five functions that you think are very useful, how do you actually make that into a package and maybe put that up on Grin so other people can use it. Um, when they would like. So um, that's kind of the RR Studio uh, layout. So, all right, thanks for coming. Oh, uh, yeah, I can.